Well, hello everybody. Welcome. The local time is 1.42 p.m. Friday afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Our program on Rangelia and exotic terrain will begin at the top of the hour at 2 o'clock local time. 16, 17 minutes from now. If you're watching this as a replay, you can go ahead and skip ahead if you like, but we're live with a few folks and uh, we're just going to say some hellos and some thank yous and all that sort of thing. So thanks for joining us. Oh, look who we have here. Hot mic. Did you want to just say hi to these guys real quick? You want to say hi to these guys? You just woke up from your nap, didn't you? Yeah, you can say these guys up here. We can just say hi to those guys, you know. I know, you just, you're perky, you want to go see some, some, you're, okay, yep, all right. He just got out here, so he's adventurous. Today we're talking about Rangelia, and uh, you are invited back Sunday morning at 2 p.m. What? That's wrong. Sunday morning at 9 a.m., which is our normal time. Sunday morning, 9 a.m., come on back 48 hours from now, less than that, and we'll talk about a person, not an exotic terrain. We'll be devoting a whole period to Karin, and I'll explain on Sunday. Okay, let me grab a little hot water here, and uh, we'll see how we're doing. The sprinkles have begun, so I'm very pleased that I'm underneath the uh, shed roof here. And assuming we have a signal out this far away from the house, uh, I think this is going to work. So... Uh, are we doing okay? Are we functional? How are you? Where are you watching from? All, all those things. Uh, Elsie from United Kingdom, Copenhagen, Denmark, Alabama, San Jose. There's a lot of five by fives. That's good to see. Uh, Jane in the UK, Marysville, Bellingham, Washington, Snowy Canadian Okanagan, Yakima, Washington, Ventura, California, New Mexico, hello, Paris, Illinois, Sammamish, that's Ashley, um, Croatia, hello, Cash Creek, BC, Ravi, what up, Tacoma, Washington, or uh, Orlando, Philly, uh, Wildemore, I think that was, California. Hungary, hello, Adam. Um, Aarhus, Denmark. Saber from, I assume, Milwaukee. I'm just grabbing little fragments of things as they roll by. Bothell, St. Louis. Thanks for the report on the quality of what's going on. I, uh, I'm thinking less and less about our connection issues. Cologne, Germany, good evening to you. Dave's in snowy Minnesota, Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, Red Deer, Alberta. Geologically speaking, from SoCal, Salt Lake City, Melbourne, Australia. Great to see you all. You know, we took a week off, so it's been almost two weeks since we've done this. Let's see if I can remember how the hell to do this. Sorry, Patrick. Uh, Clear Lake, Washington. Yeah, I did have a nice visit back in Wisconsin. Thank you for asking. Ontario, California, Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> okay. I just completely 
shut down streaming wise. Hopefully we can recover. Are we back on? We, are we working okay? Man. I'm not even phased much anymore. Look, I'm just like hypnotizing myself. This is a present from Joanne. It's like, oh, buffering? Oh, streaming problem? Oh, that's no problem. That's no problem. No, dog, that's fine. Ah, we're not streaming anymore? What? I'm not even talking to anybody? Okay. Uh, whatever. I'm a veteran now. Hey, I got some thank yous. Uh, I see comments are scrolling, so I will just uh, keep our fingers crossed. Good Lord. So, some thank yous. So here's uh, thanking the same person a second time. John in Michigan. Do you remember this one? This is a couple weeks ago. John in Michigan. He sent this beautiful handmade box made out of very exotic pieces of wood. And I shared it with you and I shared the lid. And uh, as soon as we got done with that live stream, I got an email from John like 30 minutes later. He's like, the lid broke in the mail. And I'm like, oh, it's okay, John. You know, it was, had that copper piece that was like loose in the, that was supposed to be the handle of the lid. And I said, John, it's really cool. I'll have it in my office and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to share this with all the students. But if it bugs you that I don't have the lid just as you soldered it, um, you let me know. And he said, it bugs me. Would you please send the lid back? So this box has been back and forth between Michigan and Washington two times now. <laughs> so here is the uh, repaired and resent lid from John. Here's the box. And John did extra work to get this beautiful copper piece from Michigan onto this lid. And now the lid, properly secured, is fitting nicely. And John had a couple extra things, of course. Hi, Nick. Hopefully the new design will hold together this time. I've been told that native Michigan copper sometimes has silver in it, and that may have weakened the solder bond. I have included another cool copper sample and another unusual rock a friend gave me from his father's collection. So, John, thank you for the extra effort. And... Uh, I now have your gift as it was intended. So thank you. Got a small parcel from Niall in Bragar, Scotland on the Isle of Lewis. So this made it across the Atlantic much like the, uh, well, so, a little piece of Scotland. I had to look up on Google Maps where that was, Nile, the Isle of Lewis. But I appreciate the gift. And there's a nice connection to our last topic, the Alaska, ter the Alexander Terrain, which we think came from your country. So, thank you, Nile. This is appropriate for today's show. Uh, from Bob in Aberdeen, South Dakota. 
On the subject of German chocolate cake, seeing and discussing is one thing, but tasting, aha, yes, tasting is another. Bob is remembering our live streams last spring when we had our Columbia River basalt lavas, our flood basalt stacked one on top of another, and I talked about a German chocolate cake as the analogy. So Bob has sent uh, super moist German chocolate cake mix. Betty Crocker, this episode of Nick from Home brought to you by Betty Crocker Deluxe. Delights. You gotta love it. Thank you, Bob, in South Dakota. I can't keep up with the gifts. I mean, I got a bunch more that I'll save for other shows. Uh, all I can do is say thank you. I, it's, it feels insufficient, but. That's all I can do. Uh, this box arrived from George and Dawn in Sioux City, Iowa. And George says some nice things and about Bijou. And then we live in Sioux, in Sioux City, Iowa, where Palmer Candy has been making candy for over 100 years. These candy bars are still made by hand. The cherry ones are their old standard, and the other two flavors are new. Enjoy. Palmer Candy from Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> I already had one. They're delicious. I'll hold one up here. Is this the cherry? Yeah, Twin Bing. Thank you, George and Don. COVID-19. I think most of my COVID-19 is gone on my belly, but it's probably coming back with all this, with all this uh, chocolate stuff. But hey, I'm not going to complain. And I'm not going to throw it away, so I got to dive in. All right, just a few uh, sprinkles here and there. The sun's not going to come out. We've got overcast skies. It's in the low 40s, kind of a cold rain, possibly turning to freezing rain a little bit later tonight. But uh, we're good now. And I, again, I have a roof. Yeah. So let me pause and uh, how much? I got three minutes. I guess I'm slightly concerned we're going to have another issue. Let me say hi to a few more folks and just be assured that we're uh, we're still functional here. Uh, Dwayne, hello, David from Scotland, Edinburgh, nice. Pat Miller from temporarily in Boise. Jim's from Chico, California. Lisa, Ashley, Tom, Buzz. Jim from Western Tennessee. Roberts from Calgary, Alberta. Letha Lee, still good. Hello, Patrick, age seven. Daniel from Nova Scotia, Finland. Oh man, I'm I'm uh, I'm enjoying all the the distant lands people. It's pretty late there, but I sure do appreciate you joining us. Eastern Laurentia. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Hello from the Proterozoic crater. <laughs> We got Ocean Grand from Vancouver Island, BC. That's that's our topic today, and you knew that. Oh, the sun's trying to break through for a second. That's nice. I almost want to go out in the middle of the grass, but I'm not going to. Things will change in a hurry. Okay, we got over 500 people. Sun's trying to break through. We'll use the chalkboard just a bit, not a whole lot. And I've learned a bunch of new stuff in the last three days. So I'm excited to share it with you. Okay, give me a couple minutes, would you? And we will begin. Thank you for joining us. Hot mic. He's wearing a hot mic. Oh yeah, the 
sun is actually coming out. Sweet. Jeff from Vinman's Bakery is here. You gotta love it. <coughs> sure, I'm glad they can't hear me way over here. So that's a good thing. At least they can't hear me now. Hot mic. All right, what are we talking about today? Well, a pleasant good afternoon to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. We're back at it with our exotic terrain live streams, A to Z. And we're to this show right here on Rangelia. And if you'd like to come back on Sunday morning, Pacific time, 9 a.m., we'll be talking about a very exciting topic. And the topic involves a very important emerging geologic star and uh, there's a revolution afoot, and I want to clue you in on it. And I think the timing is right to talk about Karin on Sunday after we talk about Rangelia today. So, thanks. We'll get back into our flow here the best we can. Now, I'll tell you what. The last time I saw you was almost two weeks ago, and I ended that episode called The Alexander Terrain talking about immigrants because our leading idea, it's not a for sure, by the way, but our leading idea is that the Alexander terrain, which we will bring up again today, there's a geologic connection to Northern Europe and even parts of Russia. And you'll have to go back and watch that show if, you, if you're surprised by me saying that. But I kind of worked on a theme of immigrants coming to North America from Europe, and I involved my great-great-grandfather at the very end of the show. We went down into the basement, do you remember? And looked at that trunk. And at the very end of the show, I basically said, uh, I want to be selfish here and ask if anybody can help me solve a family mystery. And this gentleman here is my great-great-grandfather, and I'm named after him. I spell it a little bit differently than this, but uh, it's N -I my, I'm N-I-C-O-L-A-U-S. And I showed you the trunk that he brought over, one of his trunks that he brought over across the Atlantic. And the mystery was, what year did Nicholas come over? And we never have been able to figure it out. Well, I got dozens and dozens and dozens of emails, more than 100 emails in the last week and a half. And I want to thank you all for trying to help out. And most of you ran into the same problems that we have, my cousins and I. We haven't been able to find much to answer what exact year did Nicholas come over uh, to uh, North America, to New Glarus, Wisconsin uh, specifically, and then what port did he use? Well, thank you to Matthias, who lives in Chur, Switzerland, 
Matthias was watching our live stream on the Alexander terrain. Within hours, Matthias emailed me a couple times and said, I think I can put you in touch with a guy who's going to be able to answer your question. Questions. Patrick in Zurich. And so before I knew it, I was emailing back and forth with Patrick in, in, in Zurich. And Patrick has spent more than 30 years researching family histories in the Canton Glarus in Switzerland, where the little town of Elm, E-L-M, is where my, my, all my people are from. So the mystery is solved. Thanks to Matthias and Patrick in Zurich, we now have a date. Monday, April 4th, 1864. And I will spread it to all of my cousins the next time we have a Zentner reunion back in New Glarus, if not before. And can't document it yet, but Patrick is quite confident, almost certain, that New York was the harbor. Uh, a harbor called Castle Garden, if we're talking about 1864, which I'd never heard of, instead of Ellis Island. So I'm starting this lecture with more thank yous, but it ties to our last lecture, and I just wanted to make sure you see this. I learned way more than that, by the way. Patrick has been at this for so long that he sent me uh, 300 pages of relatives that I have in Canton Glarus. I mean, he's got all the American folks over here. He's got all our details as well, almost like semi-creepy kind of, but not, you know. Um, uh, through Patrick and others, I was reminded that there's a very famous geologic feature that's right near this village where my ancestors came from. It's called the Glarus Thrust Vault. It's a World Heritage Site. You might have to look that up. And even the very famous and tragic rock slide in the little town of Elm. Like it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of Zentners and a few other folks. And on September 11th, 1881, my great, great, great grandfather, Casper Zentner, almost 70 years old, outran apparently and dove into some sort of culvert or some kind of ditch underneath the bridge and survived this tragic rock slide that killed, forgot to write it down, but killed more than 100 people. So uh, both my grandpa and my great, both my grandpa and my grandma on the Zentner side have uh, their uh, ancestors from Elm. So I'm like full-blooded kind of from that side of the, the family to this little town. And, and many of those details are coming into sharp focus, and I'm still going back and forth with Patrick. So thank you for indulging me. I just wanted to thank those guys at the, at the, tar, stop of the, uh, at the start of this lecture, the top of this lecture. Okay, it's time to talk about some geology. Shall we begin? The plan is our, our three-act play here. Uh, I'd like to do what we've done for the last few terrains, and that is look at a map, look at master map, and look at the new color. The color today is orange for Rangelia, I hereby declare. And then that's going to lead us to a concept. I'll be vague about it till we get there, but there's an intriguing concept that I really didn't have in my head until recently, and I'm excited to share it with you. And then our third act will be kind of trying to ask some questions about where Rangelia was created, like the original location of this terrain. And that's going to be kind of a cliffhanger uh, and spilling into Sunday, and we'll be talking about Karn Sigloch uh, on Sunday with that. Okay, but I'm going to pick up the pace now and just do a couple very quick things just to get our brains going one more time. We've been up in British Columbia, and we continue today. We did this last time, but I want to do it again very quickly. We stressed that something called the Intermontane Superterrain, the Intermontane Superterrain, was assembled out in the Pacific somewhere. Again, that's kind of fuzzy. And both the basement of Stikinia and the basement rocks of Quinellia, they're exotic terrains, but their basements are actually from North America. So the, the, the very oldest rocks in both of these guys rifted away from old North America. 
uh, made the string bean, we started to fold the string bean, I'm reviewing now, and then truly exotic material from the other side of the Pacific with Tethian fossils within it, the Cache Creek terrain, got wedged and accumulated inside of that jackknife. And then this whole thing, the intermontane super terrain, got added to old North America. What was the date? We struggled with it last time. hundred and seventy million years ago. The docking of the intermontane superterrain onto old North America. Okay, we're going to talk about another superterrain today. Let's not screw around. The INS, not the IMS, but the INS, the insular superterrain. I have it written out, I won't bother right here. But the insular superterrain is a composite as well. Superterrains are a bunch of different terrains that hooked up out in the ocean somewhere and then got added as a superterrain. The insular superterrain is last show, Alexander and Rangelia. There's a couple other things, but we won't, we'll ignore those. So before we get too involved here, I want to make sure that you realize we're going to add another super terrain, not to old North America now, but we're going to add it to this intermontane super terrain, which is essentially part of North America now. And why not? I'm still reading and still trying to figure out how uh, specific we can be with this date. But in my head right now, and I might have a slightly different date by Sunday morning, but in my head right now, is 100 million years ago. This is the main event. I think I want to call it that. The main event, even more profound and more far-reaching and more jaw-dropping, is the accretion of the insular superterrain. That's Rangelia and Alex and Alexander. And this is the accretion of intermontane superterrain. Now, much of this is kind of an old-fashioned presentation so far. I mean, this kind of message has been delivered for 20, 30 years. But I do have some brand new stuff, not only today, but especially on Sunday, that will add some detail, possibly undo some of the basic stories that have been told to this point. Okay? So I went right to kind of the, some of the main themes for today before we follow our routine. It was kind of an improv, if you must know, but what the heck, just felt right. So what's our first act? Where can we find this Rangelia terrain, which is a portion, a sizable portion, of the insular super terrain? He goes to the map, Mappy McMap. And I already hereby declared that orange is our color. I don't know, should I reveal it this way? Let's go... <laughs> Mid for dramatic flare time. So the dark blue and the light blue are part of the intermontane super terrain. The grello is the Cache Creek, and here we go. All of Vancouver Island, almost all. There's a tiny little sliver that's not Rangelia. We'll talk about it. All of Queen Charlotte Island, now known as Haida Gwaii. Please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. And a bit of mainland British Columbia as well. But wait, there's more. Yellow recall is our Alexander terrain. But there's more of Rangelia near Anchorage, Alaska. So this is our insular super terrain. It's a sizable piece of real estate. And from the improv intro that I just gave you, these two guys hooked up out in the ocean at some place and at some time. Those are some questions coming in Act 3. And then they added 100 million years ago, question mark. That's the number that keeps coming up, but i got to find good evidence to convince you and convince me of that number. Some people say 160 to 100 million, like it's a long protracted time. We've got some animations to look at, etc. 
Okay, feeling comfortable? Uh, the only new uh, location, I guess, I put these two geographic uh, island names on, and I could have done some up here, but I don't really know that country very well at all. I have used some books and some scientific papers for today's session. And I got to share this because I just found it in my faculty mailbox this morning. I ordered this a couple weeks ago. So this is a special paper 46 from, I assume, the Geological Association of Canada. Is that what it's called? Yeah. And so late November into December, we'll be talking about this large-scale displacement business, Baja, BC, and other things. But there's some kernels from this. It's a collection of scientific papers. This was published in 2006, I believe, uh, edited by Haggart, Enkin, and Monger. Of course, you know the sweet spot for this series that we're doing is these roadside books, which are not super uh, bogged down in the weeds with the details, uh, but not super broad either. Uh, depending on the author, they, they, they hit it just right for my taste. So I've showed you this from Joanne and friends, Monger and Matthews, Roadside Geology of Southern BC, Chris Yorath, who will visit again with an old uh, VHS tape, uh, The Geology of Southern Vancouver Island, and then Kathy's book up in Roadside Geology of Alaska. I say Kathy like I know her. I don't. But it's a good book. And of course, I try to fight through the science papers as well. And we're coming back to Joanne and Maurice one more time for a little bit, which is one kind of approach on the origin of Rangelia. I've shared this with you before. But much of this today is another 2009 paper by Andrew Green, and I emailed both Andrew and his former advisor, James, and they, they're not thinking about this much anymore, so they didn't have a whole lot to offer. They were very kind in both replying very quickly, but they didn't have, I had some follow-up questions on Rangeli, and they didn't have much for me. Okay, so those are the resources. What can I deliver to you? Well, we've looked at the map. You know what we do. We look at strat columns. We look at what kinds of rocks we're talking about. We don't want to get too fancy with our interpretations. What rocks are we talking about? How old are the rocks? Let's do it. Breeze is picking up slightly. I'll be able to fight that off because I'm, uh, I'm a big dude. I'm not going to fly away. So again, Going backwards, I might be annoying you that we're going back all the time, but I feel like, especially with new viewers or some of us who aren't totally locked into this stuff, we might need occasional replays to get ourselves back into it. So here's our strat columns from the three major terrains that make up the intermontane superterrain. I'm not going to go through the gory details again, but the main message was, remember, this asterisk means this thing came far from far away from the other side of the Pacific, whereas these guys are, were volcanic arcs. They were string beans. They were uh, much of their arc volcanism, and arc is a line of volcanoes, uh, almost certainly um, marked a, some sort of ocean trench and ocean subduction out in the water somewhere. But we can't say a whole lot more than that. Can't give you plate names, in other words. And then to remind you the last time I saw you, the first of our two insular guys, Alexander. Oh boy, now we got a breeze. We're going to use Mappy McMack as a, back, a backstop here. Because I have to line these up properly. This is last time. And you remember Patrick, age seven, said, hey, did you run out of room? Like, why is that thing going off the edge of the page? Yeah, I did. Uh, the oldest rocks of the Alexander, I think, go back to 600 million years old, late Precambrian. Uh, but if you recall our main conclusion, and again, I'm going to emphasize it one more time, there's still different working groups 
that ultimately have interpretations about where these terrains came from. I'm trying to give you the most common interpretation, but it's not the only for sure answer. So our, our case we made, do you remember with the old red sandstone that uh, James Hutton's unconformity in Scotland and Wales and uh, even some coral limestone, uh, limestone rich with coral in the Ural Mountains um, in Russia? So that's where we were, and we, we didn't really mention it at the time, but that's part of the insular superterrain. Well, let's get to it. Oh boy, this is going to be dramatic. Rangelia. Oh! Damn! Unnecessary. Let me get rid of that fold now that I did it so beautifully. Plain boy. Hang on, hang on, Patrick. Let me get this thing. I don't want this thing kinked out so much. So let's slow down since we're now really for the first time looking at the rocks of Rangelia. I'm going to come in real tight and then we'll compare it to Alexander. So you can read as well as I, I think, and I'm reading backwards, but we're starting from 450 million years ago and going up to as recently as about 170 million years ago. The oldest part of Rangelia, now it's orange, you, you just saw the map. We're talking about the orange, we're talking about, there's some slight differences between Rangelia up north and Rangelia down south, but I, I, don't, I choose not to focus on the differences. I'm a uniter, not a divider. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And so early on, we have the Sicker group. These are local rock formation names and rock group names. And here we are with another arc volcanic story. What does that say? There's some andesites, so we can visualize kind of some Japanese islands again, that sort of thing, some sort of ocean trench, another string bean if you want. And on top of that, still kind of looks like business as usual for us. In other words, this does sound familiar with some of our other uh, terrains, even in the other super terrain. Uh, some, some coral, fossiliferous limestone, some corals. There's, I guess, particular, thank you, Muffler Boy. There's some particularly uh, unique fossils and exotic fossils within the limestone of Rangelia, a local group called the Buttle Lake. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, I'm going to read as well with you. Bryozoans, mollusks, forams, corals, crinoids, a whole bunch of stuff. I'm no paleontologist. You know what? I'm not, but I was paging through some of these papers an hour ago, and many of these papers, especially early in this volume, this is from, again, the geological whatever of Canada. Oh, cripes, hang on, hang on. Uh, I'm in the wrong terrain, I'm in Alexander, but they, they stress all the, you can do so much paleontology. In other words, you can do so much with the fossils to not only pinpoint uh, ages, but also you can come up with some rather specific depositional environments. You know, are, are we at equatorial regions? Are we close to the equator? Are we in colder water? Um, so up until recently, again, I'm trying to tease you about Sunday. Up until recently, we had fossil work, Davy Jones and others, saying this stuff's got to be exotic. These, these, these fossils in these limestones, like they, they weren't, this, there's no way that this limestone was created here based on these exotic fossils. And then we got into the paleomagnetism, which was also saying a far traveled story. And we're going to have another Merle Beck memory today involving Rangelia. Uh, but we continue to learn with some newer techniques that do not involve fossils and paleomag. All right. So, and there's some shale. Okay, whatever. Um, it's time to sink our teeth into the main meal for today. 
on this strat column, arc volcanics, limestone, shale, flood basalts, limestone, maybe some more shale, arc volcanics, it looks like it's kind of the same old story. However, however, there is an amazing volume of basalt that erupted during a five million year span. Here's your dates to remember today. 230 to 225 million years ago. What's that? 230 to 225. There was some serious eruption of flood basalt. Not just a few basalt flows. We're going to pile a lot of basalt onto the ground, onto the limestone on to the volcanic arc story that was there already. We're going to take the string bean, we're just going to load it up with German chocolate cake. On Rangeli itself, the basalts are called the Karmutsen basalts. Up in the Rangel Mountains, and other, that's why it's called Rangelia, by the way, uh, up in southeast Alaska, those basalts are equivalent and called the Nikolai the Nikolai Greenstone, and maybe some basalts as well. So this story of erupting major amounts of basalt in five million years, and actually some newer papers talk about less than five. Maybe this stuff's coming out in just a couple million years. And you're like, well, how much? How much? Well, I've got a couple things on the whiteboard to help. Bijou's back, but he's not going to get any more screen time for the while. We're right in the middle of this. This is the intriguing concept for today. I'm transitioning now to number two. Why is all this basalt erupting quickly and voluminously to build a majority of Rangelia and ultimately a majority of the insular superterrain? Like I'm going to go off my head now, but I think... Oh, I should find it. Hang on. I'm not going to find it. You know what I do? I just read through all this stuff and I just try to grab little things that I think will work with you guys. It would help if I could find it. Uh, there's some crazy number like, uh, <laughs> I'm going to blow it now. 90% of Vancouver Island is this flood basalt, maybe more. Like, it's a lot of basalt on most of these orange areas. And it's rare to find the onset, the duration of the flood basalts, and then the cessation, the ending of the flood basalts, and then you go right back. Because if we go, Daddy's getting excited. If we go back and look, the exposures within the Rangelia terrain show a complete story. It's limestones and shales before, it's limestones and shales afterwards. And you can see the flood basalt from beginning to end. The concept is, where are these eruptions happening? If this is an exotic terrain, and it is, are we really opening up the crust right here? in southwestern British Columbia and, and having flood basalts? Is this like another German chocolate cake right over here? But do you remember the age of these, of the true German chocolate cake? Do you remember the age of the flood basalts that are burying all these colors? It started essentially 17 million years ago. And most, most of the flood basalts, of the Columbia River basalts, I'm pointing here now, I'm not talking about a terrain, starting 17 million years ago, and most of the basalts are the Columbia River basalts, the German chocolate cake that's three miles thick in the middle, uh, hovering around 16, 16 million years ago. Now, what were the ages here? And are we flooding this portion of British Columbia? Well, the answer to the first question is 230, not 16. 230 to 225-ish for the eruption of the flood basalts of Rangelia. And then for, for a bunch of reasons, we know that the flood basalt 
activity did not happen here. It happened out in the frickin' ocean. Like which ocean? Almost certainly the Pacific. But we'll have Merle and a few others try to help us, and even into Sunday morning, help us position where that flood basalt activity took place. Okay, I hope you're sufficiently intrigued and want to continue talking and learning about Rangelia. By far the most famous of the exotic terrains, by the way. If you go into the history of the exotic terrain study, as Merle's been helping us back in the early days, back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, it was truly Rangelia that was on everybody's lips. Uh, yeah, let's try this. This is not a field report. We do have a field report, by the way, today, but this is not a field report, but it's a field report photo sent in by Eric, who lives on Vancouver Island. So thank you, Eric. He took a beautiful photograph at Strathcona Provincial Park, kind of in central to north central Vancouver Island, part of Rangelia. And I don't know, I think I'm going to hold this here. Oh, no, you know, I'll just show you the photo first. Of all. It's a beautiful photograph, Eric. And I'm the guy that added some text, some yellow labels. And I copied a guy named Gary, who's going to share a bunch of beautiful photos. And he's going to put yellow labels on his photos. He has been and been sending them to me in the North Cascades. But this is our first try at looking at a beautiful photo, but then also zooming in and realizing that some of our stratigraphy that we just learned is beautifully on display. And now again, we've got a little breeze, so I'm, I'm struggling with that just a touch. But I want to see if I can hold up Eric's photo and, our, and remind you of our strat column at the same time, and then I'm out of hands. Is this going to work? So the Sickers down here, and then the Buttle Lake, and then the Karmutsen. And there's the Sicker the Buttle Lake, and the Karmutsen. So are we seeing the entire stratigraphy uh, at this provincial park? We are not. We're seeing the lower portion, aren't we? And it's the best look is the, the beautiful blonde looking stuff is this limestone that's got all sorts of tropical fossils within it. I think it might get lost on some of us that, especially if you're not from this part of North America or this part of, or, or, or if you're from other parts of the world, I'm not sure you realize how beautiful and rugged these places are. And so that's point number one, that these are beautiful places to work and it's, it's a very difficult alpine country to negotiate and to navigate as you're a field geologist. But then the fact that you're like, haven't you figured all this out by now? Like, you've been at it for 50 years. Like, why are there still questions at all? Well, if you see the terrain we're talking about and realize there's just a handful of geologists who are working on some of these problems and, and painstakingly creating these geologic maps by hand. And the fact that we've only been doing the work here in Western North America geologically really for 100 plus years, less than 150 years, uh, there's been an amazing amount of material learned in the last few decades, and, and that's, of course, a reason to be optimistic about how much more we will learn in the future. Wow, the skies continue to change. Now it's almost dark. Okay, let me grab a couple papers that have folded, uh, flo flown away. I might have to go to my toque pretty soon. Patrick? All right, let's move on. Flood basalt, I've hammered it. What's the concept? This is not controversial. Everyone agrees 
that the basalts of Rangelia represent flood basalts that flooded in the oceans. So the question, the concept is, what does that look like if you do a bunch of flood basalt activity, like you make a German chocolate cake in the ocean, as opposed to the Deccan or the Siberian traps or places on land? What, do you, what does it look like in the ocean? Looks like this. Are you aware of such a thing? An oceanic plateau. Now, I haven't taught much about oceanic plateaus to this point, like in the last 30 years that I've been teaching geology. It just hasn't really come up. But it's coming up in spades for us now. And this morning I got up extra early because I wanted to make sure I could find some dimensions. And these are just average numbers, and there's a, a crazy ranges in dimensions. But I want us to get more than just a little seamount like a little seamount. So let me hold off for this on just a second. I'm to folder number two. And I found some images that I like. And the thing I want to start with is, is what we do not want to visualize for an oceanic plateau. <laughs> Improv number seven. I've lost track already. I don't think we want to visualize what I usually teach about, which is seamounts. So our concept for the flood basalts of Rangelia is a submarine plateau, or an oceanic plateau, a much, much larger land mass than a seamount. So seamounts, this is not the topic today, but seamounts, I'm sure most of you are aware, are these amazing things, like the most famous is there's a hot spot called the Hawaiian hot spot, and then here's this trail of mountains, mostly are underwater mountains, sea mounts, little gumdrops, little chocolate gumdrops that are all strung out in a line, and there's even a really crazy kink or a bend to the Hawaiian emperor sea mount chain that shows the movement of the Pacific plate over a stationary a Hawaiian hot spot. You may not be aware that there are many other hotspots still active in the floor of the Pacific Ocean today. And one that I know nothing about until the last couple of days called the Louisville hotspot. Uh, same idea. You move that same plate, the Pacific plate, I think. You move that same Pacific plate over this hotspot, you get that same kind of seamount chain. This is not what we want to visualize for Rangelia. The volume of basalt is much too extreme to be a simple seamount story. So if we're not visualizing this, what are we visualizing? A freaking oceanic plateau, man. So let's get a similar looking map, but this time Kick it up a notch. Oh, come on. You ever get cold fingers and you can't, you lose your fine motor skills? <laughs> Reminds me of the early days of the pandemic. Don't touch your, don't touch your face. Don't, don't lick your fingers. All right. So these are not seamount chains. These are far larger plateaus. I think the famous, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the most famous of all the oceanic plateaus that we have today is called the Ant Antong Java Plateau. And those hardcore fans that we have may know that the age of the Antong and this guy and this guy are all pretty much the same age. What's the age? I can't remember. But they, most geologists now realize that these three guys used to be together as one huge. And you see, think these things are huge. This thing's the size of Alaska, by the way. It's an oceanic plateau, completely underwater, but it's the size of Alaska or Texas. Uh, there's lots of comparisons to Mexico. You know, it's just large pieces of land. 
And what am I showing you? Every red blotch on that map is one of these oceanic plateaus. And why are we talking about it today? Well, isn't it obvious? The Karmuts and Basalt, beautifully exposed in Rangelia, used to look like this out in the Pacific. And there's so much German chocolate cake underwater. It's a submerged German chocolate cake. What a shame. That if you bring this oceanic plateau and you approach it and it goes into a trench and you try to subduct or destroy something this big, it's not going to work. There's too much mass. So you're going to like partially subduct a huge plateau, but it's basically they're just going to kind of choke the trench. I'm ahead of myself now, but I couldn't hold it. You're starting to get the concept. The basalt of Rangelia was deposited as a huge oceanic plateau. And you're like, which one? Which one? Well, these are the ones we have today. I'm just trying to give you the concept that that there are many, and I would like, I don't know anything about most of these. I barely know a little bit about Antong. And the Caribbean, brand new to me, yesterday, that there is a major oceanic plateau underneath the waters of the Caribbean. You want to see a map? The Caribbean, or the Columbia Caribbean Oceanic Plateau. This whole thing is one of these German chocolate cakes underwater. And then the more familiar, uh, I'm going to embarrass myself now, I don't know the geography well enough, but the Antilles in here, and the Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica, I'm sure you've got other islands that are kind of ringing this whole thing, but I didn't realize there was this huge oceanic plateau smack dab in the middle of the Caribbean. So I'm giving you another map that again is showing, this one's obviously showing continental flood basalts, but I really want to show you how many of these, well here's another name for you, Large Igneous Province. It's kind of a generic name, but it's, it's in the literature now as kind of a way to describe these things. These Large Igneous Provinces on land and, today's topic, underwater are a thing today, and they were a thing when? Did he freeze? Buffering? Is he frozen? 230 to 225 million years ago, that's the flood basalt, that's the German chocolate cake, that's the submarine oceanic plateau that we are building in a hurry that today is part of the exotic terrain called Rangelia. I'm having fun. Uh, Kathy, different color, but the greens are the exciting number of submarine plateaus sitting on the floor of these oceans. So it's a concept now, of course, we want to go further, don't we? Like, what's the obvious question? Why are they there? That's not a small event. Again, this is not a small chain of seamounts strung on in a line. This is a massive, I'm running out of adjectives now, but you've got the idea. Look at the dimensions here. An average of three miles thick for a German chocolate cake. The Antong Java Plateau is 20 miles thick. And I'm just giving you a feeling for size. To be honest, I can't remember which one. Maybe it is Antong. I guess it is Antong. That was, uh, that's how much surface area. Again, something the size of Alaska, or size of Texas, or size of Mexico is the acreage, and completely underwater, I might add, right? There's, there's not a part of this that you can live on. There's an average of, you know, a mile and a half, two miles of water uh, above these large igneous provinces that were built quickly on the ocean floor. All right. 
Well, I'm building towards something and you're like, oh, this is going to be good. He's going to explain why the Karmutsan basalts were created 230 million years ago in the Pacific. No, I'm not. Because we don't really know. So I, 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 I let you know early on, I let you know, didn't I, that number three is going to be kind of out there. And I don't know, I might even hear from a few of you uh, in the next day with, with some more leads. But as I understand it from all the reading I've been able to do, it's still an open question about where that flood basalt was extruded in the Pacific 230 million years ago. And more importantly to us, why? Why are you just belching all this basalt out of the ocean? Is it at a spreading ridge? It doesn't even look like they're at a spreading ridge. It doesn't even, there's so much basalt, it doesn't even appear to be a simple mid-Atlantic ridge type of a thing. Well, I can't hold it. I got a, uh, some of you I'm sure are ahead of me. This is an old kind of cartoon. Oh, here, I'm sorry, here, here we go. Here's a bathymetric look at the biggest and most impressive. Remember, this is just a fr uh, fragment of this bigger thing that got split into three. But yeah, size of Alaska, completely underwater. All right, so here's, I don't know how controversial this is, to be honest. I haven't done that much reading. But as I understand it, many are tying this very rapid accumulation of flood basalt in the ocean to some sort of mantle plume, to some sort of hotspot. And there is actually a website called mantleplumes.org where you can spend weeks probably reading about mantle plumes. I don't think it's super controversial to make this connection, to say that the main reason that you're creating all this basalt in the ocean so quickly and, and, and so big, the German chocolate cake so big, is tied to some sort of heat source. But then if you do that, and then you're moving a tectonic plate, again, we can't do that. We're too far back in time. We don't know the names or the sizes or the directions of the ocean plates. They're all gone. They've all been destroyed. They've all been subducted. Kind of. You'll see on Sunday. But the idea that I'm leading toward is there is a potential connection between these oceanic plateaus worldwide today. I mean, let's not forget, let's not go back more than 200 million years ago because it's very difficult to reconstruct that. But can we just look at our planet today and can we address why these large igneous provinces are located where they are? Many have tried and many tie them to active hotspots. So you have a stationary blowtorch, a geologic hotspot, and you're like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I was taught that mantle plumes, we're not sure they're stationary anymore. Yeah, we're pretty sure now. We're pretty sure. We're back to being pretty sure. Geophysics, again, Sunday morning. We're pretty sure that these mantle plumes are stationary. So if you're losing it a little bit, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that a stationary hotspot somewhere in the Pacific, at some latitude and longitude in the old Pacific, 230 million years ago, probably created the Rangelia flood basalts. But what was the hotspot? Is the hotspot still with us? Do hotspots die? If hotspots don't die, which hotspot that we have today used to be responsible for that. Why not? I'll say it. Is it possible the Yellowstone hotspot, which today is in Wyoming, was once upon a time out in the Pacific Basin somewhere? Yeah, most people agree that's true. I shouldn't say most. Some researchers assume that the Yellowstone hotspot is long-lived and if we go back far enough in time, the Yellowstone hotspot's out in the Pacific somewhere. Well, is the Yellowstone hotspot a thing 230 million years ago? And is it possible that our string bean from God knows where 
drifted in the neighborhood and then on top of the Yellowstone hotspot to create our stratigraphy of coral reefs uh, on a volcanic arc and then we suddenly bury it all with a German chocolate cake and then we go back to making a flood basalt, uh, we go back to making a volcanic arc again. It's tough to prove that, but to, it's, it's tempting to connect paleo latitude, amazing large igneous provinces created in a hurry, and maybe going back to a former hotspot location or a place where an ocean floor moved over. A stationary hotspot. Okay, we're to, to Act Three, which is short, and then we're going to go to a field report and a mural memory. Actually, we might have a mural memory right now. We have many themes running through this exotic terrain series. One of them is involving characters who've been contributing in many ways. Merle Beck, who will continue to talk about, has been emailing me personal memories from uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, with some of the early geologists who came up with the concept of exotic terrains. We've done two of these already, and I'd like to read to you now. The Rangelia Paleomagnetic Conundrum by Merle Beck. So we're to number three, and some of this is, we're not ready for some of this, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. We don't know much about paleomagnetism yet in this series, but let me do it anyway. This is Merle who lives in Bellingham in his late 80s. Here we go. In the earliest days of terrain excitement, the name most prominently discussed was Rangelia. As Nick has explained, Rangelia is an accreted terrain outboard of most of the current versions of the Western North American collage of terrains. Hello. Rocks comprising Rangelia show it to be the latest Paleozoic and earliest Mesozoic in age. That's the, the original volcanic arc. Rangelian type rocks occur in bits and pieces from Alaska down to Vancouver Island and possibly to northeastern Oregon. Let's put that in the back of our mind. A big chunk is exposed on Vancouver Island. The largest, as you might expect, is located in the Rangel Mountains of southern Alaska. Next paragraph. Lucky for us paleomagnetists, Rangelia contains some volcanic rocks that have survived with their magnetic single mostly intact. Hang in there. We don't know about it yet, but I just want to give you a sense that much of the attention to Rangelia in Merle's day, 40 years ago, was on the paleomagnetic signature in the basalts as they were erupting in the German chocolate cake underwater to help try to locate the original position of that oceanic plateau. I maybe just stole Merle's thunder here. I'm sorry. Uh, Rangelia contains some volcanic rocks that have survived with their magnetic signal mostly intact. These have been investigated in several places, notably the Rangel Mountains proper, Talkeetna Formation, that's Jack Hill House and USGS crew, and Vancouver Island, the Karmutsen Formation by Ted Irving and company. I am going to drastically oversimplify what these two studies found. This is Merle talking. The rocks in question are roughly 230 million years old. Their direction of magnetism is very approximately shallowly upward to the north. This gives rise to the conundrum. Hang with me. That's me talking. As you certainly know, the geomagnetic field has two steady states, polarities. We call them normal polarity and reverse polarity. In a normal field, a rock magnetic direction of northward and up indicates origin in the southern geographic hemisphere. Alternatively, given a reversed magnetic field, the upward magnetic direction indicates origin in the northern hemisphere, but with the magnetic vector pointing south. I don't follow it either i got to keep studying this geomagnetic stuff, this paleomagnetic stuff. Thanks, Merle, though. Thus, the paleomagnetic data, here's where he helps us out. The paleomag data, which are nearly impeccable, leave us with two choices. Either Rangelia was in the southern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, south of the equator, 
230 million years ago, hence has been transported many, many thousands of kilometers northward, or Rangelia was in the northern hemisphere at that time, and subsequently has moved much further, and subsequently has moved much less far northward, but has rotated 180 degrees in the process. One of these is almost certainly correct. What to do? Well, in the 1980s, it was common to yield to one innate fixist bias. Fixist is talking about how much did these things move around. And opt for which scenario required the least relative displacement. So the second alternative tended to be favored. In other words, northern hemisphere. At that time, however, Merle, I was a wild-eyed mobilist, and I still am. So I favor the southern hemisphere alternative. What do you think, says Merle. So I can kind of translate, but I'm not the guy to really translate until I, I, I try to learn more about Merle's world. But we're, we're trying to speculate on where this large igneous province known as Rangelia's flood basalts was located in the ocean, south of the equator or north of the equator. And from the fossil work, it's equatorial. From Merle's work, it's got to be south of the equator. From other work, it's got to be north of the equator. So I've shown this to you before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but these colors are just the position of North America, 220, 190, 90, 50, and today. But at the same time, they're lumping both of these guys together, which is not appropriate, actually. But they're, let's just think of it as Rangelia. Uh, they've got Rangelia starting in the north, in the northern hemisphere. So these guys are the fixest. They're, they're less mobile than some others. And they're just going to have this thing come up and dock about 100 million years ago. Oh, it's really raining hard now. My toque is out in the rain. I don't care. It's the top of the hour almost. So let's finish with, you're probably sick of these maps by now. I got to do this first. Hang on. Hang on, Patrick. There was a lot on my little strat column, most of which I commented on, but I purposely did not talk about this until right now. And so now we're into the late part of this program where there are unsolved mysteries, as far as I can tell. Do you remember in the improv intro? I said that Rangelia and Alexander together are the insular superterrain. And I was careful to say that we're sure that Rangelia and Alexander hooked up out in the ocean and then got added 100 million years ago as a superterrain. Alexander, we think, came from northern Europe, correct? Where did Rangeli come from? Northern Europe as well? South of the equator, according to Merle? Like, is Rangeli coming from south of the equator and Alexander's coming through the Arctic and then they're hooking up out in the ocean and then coming in together? And when did the hookup happen? Do we know? Unsolved mystery time. Did you notice this? Right in the middle. That's why I wanted to get rid of this fold. Um, I'll just go for it. In a number of passages, papers, etc., apparently there's a granite. It's called the Barnard Glacier Granite. It's a pluton, and it's a stitching pluton that's been dated at, specifically, 309 million years old. Hang with me. That granite invades from below both Alexander and Rangelia. So I need to slow down and make sure we know this concept. Struggling to find Marley's sketch, which I've showed you a couple times quicker. Here it is. 
So for the first time, we're really looking at, we're looking for specific evidence to prove that two terrains get hooked up out in the ocean. How would you possibly do that? We know the age of this hand and the age of this hand, but how do we get the age of when the two hands get added together? Rangeli and, and Alexander. One way to do it is to find a stitching pluton, a blob of magma that came up from below, but came up from below when the two hands are already together. And so if the stitching pluton is eating into both of my hands, melting both of my hands at the same time, and we know the age for the pluton, what can we say? I just said that this stitching pluton called the Barnard Glacier Pluton is 309 million years old, which tells us what? Tells us that Rangeli and Alexander hooked up out in the ocean sometime earlier than 309 million years ago. Well, here's 309-ish years invading both of these guys. Is that really the story? And does that help us understand where this guy came from and where this guy came from? Again, Northern Europe, almost leading idea, Northern Europe. Merle's talking about south of the equator. So what are we going to do? Well, we can talk about another date. And this is coming from a, a couple of animations we're going to look at late today in the Cozy Fort. And this is more of the work that we'll talk about on Sunday. In the animations, they've got these two guys hooking up, I think. Oh, no, that's not right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's keep it like this. The best evidence we have is a stitching pluton 309 million years ago that proves that these two guys got hooked up out in the ocean here. These dates are talking about when the intermontane accreted to the insular, but there's a new wrinkle and that's why I got confused. According to the animations, Hang with me. According to the animations, the intermontane is going to dock more than once. 170 gets docked, but in the animations, they're going to bring it back out again. That was new as of uh, three hours ago. Still trying to process it. Okay, I think if nothing else, you get the idea that there's open questions involving original location and also docking history to themselves and also to other super terrains and then also to old North America. Uh, to give an idea, I don't even know who this is. They've got Rangeli and Alaska together 309 million years ago, older than 309 million years ago, up in the Arctic and coming down as a unit. And these kind of look like Joanne and, and others maps and they don't show that here. You've seen these a number of times. I'm going to do it one more time very quick. Really raining now. Alexander's on this map, 425. We don't have Rangelia yet at all. 395. We're going to start bringing Alexander through the Arctic Seaway, which is not technically the Arctic because we're lower than 30 degrees north. We've already talked about it a bunch of times. 360. We still don't have Rangelia. I don't have to find the strat column again, but we don't even have those oldest rocks yet. We don't have the sicker yet, I don't think, right? Now, suddenly, 290 million years ago, here's Rangelia for the first time. Wrong color for us. Orange solders next to yellow. And remember, our stitching pluton says that that stitching, that hooking up, happened out in the water somewhere sometime earlier than 309 million years ago. This is Joanne from 10 years ago. They're still out there, outboard of the string beam. They're still out there, outboard of the folding string beam, the jackknifing. 180, they're still out there, and we're almost bringing in the intermontane superterrain for the first time. So if you were waiting for a bigger payoff, 
It doesn't exist. As far as I can tell, there's more work to be done, as they say. But we do know some things, and the strat column is one of those. Uh, it's dark enough, I even wonder if I need the cozy fort, but I guess I'll do it just to be, just because it's fun. So it's 3.03 here, and I, I'm glad that you're still with us. I forgot to get these in their slot, so it's going to take me a couple extra minutes. Sorry about that. Sorry, this is a Canadian topic. Sorry, sorry about that now there. Oh, God. Go Leafs. Sorry about that there. Look who Slander of a whole people. You remember Jerome Lessman? Geology professor at Vancouver Island University? He's our field correspondent today. Jerome, with his cell phone, shot two videos, and we're only going to look at one of them today, because we're going to hold off on the Nanaimo group. Jerome lives in the town of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island, and Nanaimo group is part of Rangelia, but it's too young for our story today, so I've chosen to Hold off on Nanaimo for a little while. Hope you're okay with that. Well, it's one of those days where the weather changes every 10 minutes. How many we got here? 735 watching. That's great. Okay. So am I muted? No. Get rid of the live chat. We'll get to question and answers in just a bit, like I have answers. Oh, emails from people who are upset about their midterm that they took this morning. Yeah, yeah I guess you should have studied. You ever think of that? Uh, let's start with Jerome. Why not? This is, uh, Jerome emailed me and said, I, I couldn't. I couldn't get it under three minutes. I, can't, I just can't do it. Like he, he, he teaches geology for a living, so he's, he's allowed. So let's crank the volume on Jerome. He's going to give us a little look and listen uh, near Nanaimo, British Columbia. We'll go full screen. Hi everybody, welcome to Nanaimo, British Columbia. Welcome also to Rangelia and the insular superterrain. I'm Jerome Lessman and I teach earth science at Vancouver Island University and today I'm on my local rocky shoreline taking you to a couple stops where we can see some really interesting rocks that tell us a lot about the history of Rangelia. Let's talk terrains first because we mentioned the insular superterrain so let's explain what that is. The insular superterrain is actually a grouping of a number of terrains with three major components, Rangelia and Alexander. Rangelia is in fact split into two segments, a northern segment and a southern segment exposed along Vancouver Island largely. In between the two is the Alexander. A lot of the rocks that make up Vancouver Island and the southern Rangelia segment are part of what has been called the Karmutsen Formation. Karmutsen, we're with you. The Karmutsen formation is largely basalt. And so it's a volcanic rock. And you have to think of Vancouver Island as a very large area of former volcanism. However, that volcanism is not what most people typically think of when they think of volcanoes. Most of the rocks that make up Vancouver Island erupted underwater. And so you have to picture in your mind a vast area of submarine eruptions building an extensive submarine plateau. So how do we in fact know that Karmutsen and a big part of Rangelia erupted underwater? On these outcrops, we see very diagnostic features of those eruptive events. 
namely that the basalts form large amalgamations of pillows. Good. The pillow forms are well exposed in some of the sea cliffs at Neck Point, and I can point them out with my stick for you. Here's a great example of a pillow, and you have to picture that the erupting lava was cooling very quickly, almost instantaneously in contact with water to form that bulbous shape. Beautiful. There's another one, or a portion of one, right here, and we can clearly see that circular pattern that defines the basalt pillow. The story of Carmutsen basalt and Rangelia in southern British Columbia gets a little bit more complex. What we know is that from the initial conditions of submarine eruptions, there was over time a transition into subaerial conditions. So the submarine plateau eventually built up sufficiently thick to break through the water surface and erupt in contact with air. The eruptive events transition to subaerial, and that's recorded by the presence of columnar joints, much like you'd find in central Washington, and even preservation of very delicate ropey textures on pahoehoe flows, much like what you'd see in Hawaii. Excellent. And so based on the extent of Carmutsen basalt, the eruptive styles and structures, the transitions into uh, the subaerial components, the eruptive events of Rangelia are considered to be a large igneous province, and many of the flows, particularly the subaerial ones, are considered to be flood basalts. The last major point we have to make about Rangelia is one of the trickiest questions to answer, but at the same time one of the most crucial. You know from prior shows that when you deal with terrains, there are kind of two fundamental questions to ask. What is the age of the rocks? And when did they actually dock to Western North America? So the first question, the age of the rocks, Carmutes and basalts, all these eruptive events, these flood basalts, they happen somewhere in the uh, age range of about 225 to 230 million years ago. The second question in terms of docking is maybe less clear, but there's good evidence suggesting that by 100 million years ago, Rangelia had largely docked to Western North America. So those two crucial dates frame both the eruptive events and the episodes of docking and accretion to the pre-existing terrains at the Western seaboard of North America. Thank you, Jerome, that was excellent. Wonderful detail from your own backyard. And again, he's got another one for us uh, from the neighborhood, but I'm gonna hold off on that one. Uh, we move right on. We turn off email, we don't need more student emails now. My dog ate my rooster and uh, I don't know what. Okay, you remember this guy, this German guy? I forget his name, Rowan maybe? Uh, he's got a little, he's got amazing videos and I just, he's talking a little bit about Antong, uh, the oceanic plateau. Let's just do less than a minute of this, mainly to listen to the accent, but also his visuals are great. ...and have a volume of at least 100,000 cubic kilometers. By that definition, we know at least 40 of these provinces from the last 550 million years alone, of which about a dozen probably exceeded the definition by at least tenfold. Of course, erosion and tectonic processes have, in most cases, weathered away or destroyed a lot of it, making estimations of their original extent challenging. But the fact that you can still see the astonishing remnants of these eruptions today, in some cases hundreds of millions of years after their formation, speaks to the scale of these eruptions. Large igneous provinces. We can divide large igneous provinces into continental and oceanic provinces. Our record of oceanic ones is, however, limited, because as opposed to continental plates, the oceanic crust is constantly getting recycled by tectonic processes and is therefore, with rare exceptions, nowhere older than 180 million years. The most notable of the oceanic provinces is probably the great Ontong Java Here we go. in the southwest Pacific. It consists of a series of provinces that, during their formation 120 million years ago, probably made up one enormous plateau. Here, over an area the size of Australia, the largest lava eruption in the last couple hundred million years took place. Damn, over son. the course of 7 million years, a total of 80 million cubic kilometers of basaltic <laughs> lavas were expelled. Uh. That's enough lava to bury the entire United States under 10 kilometers or 6 miles of molten rock. On land we have, aside from the Siberian traps, for instance the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province that formed 201 million years ago in the center of Pangaea before the subsequent breakup of the supercontinent. Thank you for that. Facts in Motion YouTube channel. Outstanding stuff. 
another segment of uh, Chris Yorath's uh, classic video shot, I think in the early 1990s, kind of has that look and sound. Uh, but there's a little segment here on Rangeli that I thought would be fun to include. And one of those books I shared with you, I think it was Geology of Southern Vancouver Island, that's Chris's work. Never met Chris, but I'm a big fan. Other things were happening. Terrains were being formed. Pieces of crust that eventually collided with the edge of the continent. Terrains are pieces of the Earth's crust which preserve unique geological histories, each of which is different from that of neighboring terrains. The word is spelled T-E-R-R-A-N-E, -E, as opposed to T-E-R-R-A-I-N, which refers to the form or character of the ground surface. The western part of the Cordillera is made up of several terrains, each of which formed in places far removed from where they are today. An example of one such terrain is Rangelia, a name reserved for the large fragment of crust that makes up most of Vancouver Island, the Queen Charlotte Islands, and parts of southeastern Alaska. From the campground here at Horn Lake on Vancouver Island, Horn Lake. we can see some of the characteristic rock formations of Rangelia up on the cliffs of Mount Mark. The God prominent dang, pale that's amazing. and dark banded cliffs of the mountain are composed of limestone that accumulated upon the eroded cones of volcanoes. The limestone is made of the broken shells of marine organisms, such as corals, brachiopods, and crinoids, that flourished in tropical waters where this terrain originated. Older than the flood Above basalt. Above the limestone, the dark-looking rocks are marine lavas that poured across the limestone banks and built a volcanic pile in excess of six kilometers thick covering all of Rangelia. Beautiful. The other terrains that make up much of British Columbia and the Yukon... We're just seeing a tiny fraction of the flood basalts there, right? Each is composed of rocks that formed... In but that contact between the underlying limestone and that basalt and that really weird geometry I thought was fascinating. We finish here in the Cozy Fort with a video that I shared with you a couple of shows ago, and I'll probably show it again to you on Sunday morning uh, by one of Karen Siglo's uh, PhD students, I believe, Henderson, in 2014. And this is Ivana, Ivana's YouTube channel. And I mentioned Ivana's amazing work before, who lives in New York City, uh, amateur geologist, but super into it. And he took Henderson's stills and put them together in a little animation for us. And we'll play this a couple times because I still don't get everything that we're looking at, but we'll try. No sound on this. Dates in the upper left. We got a bunch of string beans out there. I'm just going to continue showing this to you until we totally understand what we're looking at. But Ivana has... Um, done us a great service there's some serious Baja BC action going on but that's not going to make sense until December for us I don't know I'll try it again and maybe I can try to point out intermontane and insular even though I'm not totally sure Okay, this thing starts at 196, so that's 25 years before we accrete the intermontane, intermontane superterrain for the first time. So, Daddy might be wrong, but according to this animation, and you'll see the data we have for this on Sunday. It's not the fossil stuff, it's not Merle's paleo mag, it's something else. Uh, but the two string beans, I think intermontane on the right and insular on the left. So they're, they're kind of parallel string beans. Let's play it. Is that thing going to add 170-ish? Sure looks like it to me. And then it's coming back out, which I just don't get. And look at how stationary insular is. Till they finally hook up, there's the 130 that I mentioned. 
And then there's all this other crap out there. Sorry, Patrick. I don't know what that is. And then it's even bigger super terrain than there's something about Guerrero, which is down in Mexico. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Right. So then the brand new animation that just came out again from Karin Siglo's uh, lab, work by Clanette. Again, we'll talk more. But I'm just kind of setting you up for Sunday, really. They color things, and this is why I chose orange for insular, by the way. I'll let you just watch it once. Orange is insular. I mean, they're restoring ocean plates for us, and we can talk about that. My God. Let's try it one more and we'll quit. Um, so orange is insular and purple, purple, is intermontane. Can you do that in your mind? Purple is intermontane, not our blues, not our shades of blue, but purple for them. And they, interestingly, they start the animation at 170. There's reasons for that. They're going to start it after Intermontane has docked the first time. But they have Rangelia, Alexander, and Guerrero out there by themselves. I don't know anything about Guerrero. I don't know anything about those, that first word, that red. I have no idea what that is. So there's work to do, but it's... I don't want to give away Sunday's meeting, but it's an exciting leap forward in trying to reconstruct these ocean plates. All right. Thank you for your patience. These shows get longer and longer. I don't care. You don't, there doesn't seem to be a mass exodus at, at an hour mark, so, you know, what the heck? If I got stuff to, to share with you, we're going we're gonna to do it. It's time for live Q&A, which is the last part of our session this afternoon. Bijou needs to get in the house. Would you allow me to go get Bijou into the house? And then I'll scroll back and answer your questions. Uppercase, please. I'll be right back. Hey, man, you getting wet? Are you wet and cold over here? Oh, yeah, let's let you in. Let's, it's OK. It's all right. Let's let you in. There you go. In you go. You're welcome. Such a polite cat. Thank you. So there's more open endedness to this one than previous shows. This one then Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Pops the chat out like a boss. I'm going to scroll back. I'm going to get on live chat right between the eyes. I'm going to go back. We'll try to do some, some live Q&A. Okay, I'm back four minutes. I don't see any uppercase. And Patrick, age seven, at what point is a terrain considered docked when it is fully accreted? Excellent question, Patrick, as always. Patrick, up until this week, I thought once you add a terrain to the edge of North America, I thought that was it. So docking, like a ferry coming in and hitting the dock or kissing the shore, I thought that was it. But we'll see on Sunday, apparently, that there's evidence of these things coming in, Patrick. And then they go out again for a while, and then they come back in. I don't know how they know that, and I don't know what verbiage we should use for that. 
So I'm using docked and accreted the same way, Patrick, and I, I'm just going to stick with that until I can kind of get more sophisticated. Ronnie's Crazy Adventure 24-7 asks, What are you talking about? What is this? I don't understand this. Thank you for your time, Ronnie. Your handle seems to fit. Myra, is there a way to determine whether the basalt of Rangelia is related to the Yellowstone hotspot? Good question. All I know, Myra, is that you can do some geochemical work with certain basalts. I think the isotope helium, a certain isotope of helium uh, can indicate a mantle plume source. I don't know anything more than that. Um, but that's just to tie it to a hot spot. I think, I think to prove it was the Yellowstone hot spot is more involved in reconstructing the ocean plates, which may be a, a total uh, difficult thing. It's a shame we're not in the sun now. I'm totally in the shade and the sun's out again. Thanks for the question. 101 Rotary Power. Is there data or evidence where group boundaries are located in the ocean offshore and around islands? Group boundaries are located. I don't think I get the question. I'm sorry. Steve, how does Nanaimo Group fit into this? Um, thank you, Steve. Nanaimo sediments are truly that sediments that are laid on top of these terrains long after they were added. And studying the Nanaimo sandstones, for instance, are very crucial in putting together a movement history after the terrain's docked. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what we're going to be doing in December. I want to get in the sun. Hang on. I guess I'm also going to test if I still have streaming over here. Next to the English oak now. Are we still functional? Uh, yeah, so more to come on the Nanaimo and potential connections to the North Cascades, by the way. Uh, Kyle, is the strat column, in the strat column, are the flood basalts covering Alexandra and Rangelia? I don't think so. Good question. Oh. Interesting. Uh, we don't have major flood basalts in Alexander. Is that evidence that the linking, the hooking up has to be after the Alexander? I see your thinking there, Kyle. I think we only have that one stitching pluton, which is more than 50 million years older than the flood basalts. So why didn't Alexander get buried in flood basalts as well? Really interesting. We have to remember that the flood basalts are no longer in their original horizontal position. And I don't know how much, maybe half of that um, Oceanic Plateau has been crammed down into the trench and is not at the surface. So that might help us explain some of that. Uh, automatic scroll, thank you. Eric, no Carmoots and flood basalts. Oh, same, same question. I never thought about that, you guys. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Geneva, I'm sorry. Uh, why is it called Rangeli? It's just called after the Rangel Mountains, as I understand it. Many things in geology are named after a town or a creek or a mountain or a ridge or a basin where they're best exposed. Basin, where they're best exposed. Uh, Papagino, could the mantle plumes be caused by asteroid impact? Why not? Nobody's got an explanation. Hard to prove it, but it's possible. Zig, sta, is the strength of a suture related to its depth? 
And I've noticed a bunch of you asking kind of about like what holds these terrains together. And I think you're kind of at that as well, like the strength of a suture. Almost like you're um, sewing something together and then like, is it going to hold or is it going to fall apart again? I don't know how to answer that. And I guess up until recently, I would say once you dock something, it's, it's not it's going to be, those trains are going to stay together. But now we just looked at these animations where the stuff's ripping away and going back out in the water. So I don't know how to answer that. Uh, Pixel, any new volcanism coming for British Columbia? It could be, but I don't know. We're, we're focused on so long ago. Our stories are older than 100 million years ago and older than 50 million years ago for this session. So I'm not thinking that way right now. Robert, is Vancouver Island still docking or is it bouncing out or it attached to the Canadian plate? Uh, it is firmly, Robert, uh, these terrains we've talked about in British Columbia are, are not going anywhere. They are part of the North American plate and have been for 100 million years. There's still one terrain in Alaska that's still being added. But I would think of everything as being rock solid <laughs> uh, and not about to head out back out to sea. They're, they're, and, and to do that, you need ocean plates that are uh, doing something offshore. And, I, and more coming on that. Thank you for the great questions. Adventure Sombrata. According to the maps and animation, all of Alaska is composed of accreted terrains. Is that really the case? More or less, yeah. There's maybe a little bit up in the north. More or less, yes. And uh, I picked up in Kathy's book, I think, that uh, almost all of the exotic terrains in Alaska have a, came through the Arctic, have a northern Europe, northern Eurasia origin, uh, except for that Cache Creek and apparently some of this Rangelia. I meant to do more with that, by the way. It's lost the sun again. It really is changing. Um, I think there are some, including Joanne, I guess, that still view the Rangelia terrain coming through the Arctic. And then there's others that say, no, it came from the Pacific, but north of the equator. And then there's the Merle folks who say, no, Pacific and definitely from south of the equator. And that's the part that we're still struggling with. And maybe it is doing some work with the history of hotspots and, and trying to locate. If we're assuming there's a connection between the oceanic plateau and a hotspot, and that's a big if, I guess. But if we're assuming that and we know the hotspots don't move and we know the hotspots are long lived, then can't you just get, go back 230 million years and figure out where the hotspots are? Maybe you can't. I don't, I don't know. I'm asking myself, I don't know. A few more, this is fun. Uh, don't know about the origin of the hotspots. Toughen up. Do the flood basalts over, oh, same question. I didn't expect that question. I never thought to ask that question, really good. Are the seamount terrains of similar derivation, i.e. Hawaiian versus intermontane? are the seamount terrains. Well, at least with our program so far, with our series, I've, I've chosen big and obvious terrains. And as I view it, an individual seamount or two is much too small to be contributing to a separate terrain. So some of this involves the history of the mapping and, and people going nuts coming up with terrains. I think we're going to the San Juan Islands next Friday. I'm not totally sure, but I'm pretty sure. By the way, if you bought that roadside of, of Washington book, the Marley and Darrell book, and you're like, what the, I bought this thing, you know, we're still not using it? I think we're gonna start using it next Friday. And my point is, there's a lot of terrains that are not very big compared to these big boys up in British Columbia, and yet they're still called terrains. Travis, do the exotics have a special material that bonds them together? Yeah, it's that, that kind of talking about the, the, the glue. I need to come up with a way to answer that because it's a, it's a common question, but I don't know how to answer it. Three more. 
Dennis, clarifying, the limestones are older than the flood basalts? Yes, and they're younger than the flood basalts. So there's limestones below and above this entire Karmutsin flood basalt sequence. And that's what makes the exposure of that flood basalt story so complete. What was Merle's word? He was talking about paleomag, but like ex exquisite? No, what did he say? I can't remember. Uh, Pat wonders if hotspot lava changes in composition over time. I don't think so. But there's so much about hotspots we don't know. We don't really still know why they are where they are. There's a couple dozen hotspots globally, and they're, they, they appear to be randomly arranged. Jason, is, there, is it accurate to think of North America as a snowplow scraping land off the subducting plates? Perfect way to transition to Sunday. I'm going to ask it again because this is a perfect setup for Sunday. Is it accurate to think of North America as a snowplow scraping land off subducting plates? Jason? Yes. If the ocean plate is diving beneath North America, but what if the ocean plate is diving the other way? That's Sunday. A toast to you. Stealing some of my wife's wine. TGIF. This episode of Nick from Home brought to you by Cupcake. Pour me a little bit of that manly cupcake wine, a Pinot Grigio. Yes, please. It's 42 degrees with a cold drizzle. I'd say a Pinot Grigio pairs nicely with those conditions. In honor of Clyde J. Zoya, here's to you. Here's to your health. Oh, this is delightful. I'm in trouble, though. Here's to your motivation to learn new things, to keep checking in with us. Even crazy 24-7 guy. Stick around, man. Join the party. We learn new things, and we open our minds and our hearts to new things. Here's to that. And here's to that. That's the end of our Rangelia program here on a cold and dreary, mostly, Friday afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I thank you for tuning in. I have most of Sunday morning's program already put together, including emails from Karin and Mitch and some ways to talk about a very exciting new collection of ideas that we will get into on Sunday morning. I'm waving goodbye to you now, assuming that we are still communicating. I love you, thank you, and goodbye. Cupcake.